Kia ora from New Zealand. My name's Steve Holroyd and I'm the chair of the International Dairy Federation's Methods, Standard Steering Group. That's the part of IDF that's responsible for the uh, analytical standards for dairy products. And it covers a, a large number of different projects and areas of activity. I'm privileged today to moderate the, uh, our joint webinar on the use and harmonization of global standards. And this marks the 20th anniversary of the partnership between IDF and ISO uh, in the joint publication of standard, analytical standards for milk and milk products. Just some housekeeping issues I'd like to cover first. Please uh, mute yourself and keep your camera off during the duration of the webinar. We'd like to focus on the speakers uh, today. You can send questions at any time during the chat please put them in. We'll have a, a question and answer session at the end after the, uh, the speakers that we've had, and we will cover those questions off. So Mark, the, to, the format of this webinar today is we've got some introductory remarks from the head of the respective organizations, IDF and ISO. And then we've got four expert speakers who will talk about the practical implementation of dairy standards and give examples as well. To start off, we've got the International Dairy Federation's Director General, Carolyn Amond. Please, Carolyn. Thank you so much, Steve, for giving me the floor. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us today to celebrate 20 years of publication of joint standard between IDF and ISO. Such a significant and fruitful collaboration worth to commend. As the leading source of scientific and technical expertise for all stakeholders of the dairy chain since 1903, IDF value collaboration. Milk quality and safety has always been at the art of IDF work. Our vision is to support the efforts of the global dairy sector to provide safe, nutritious, sustainable, and accessible dairy products to the world's population, while being a source of economic and social vitality in agriculture communities in the dairy sector. Our mission is to strengthen the global dairy sector by collecting, extending, managing, and sharing science-based dairy expertise and insight for policy development and standard setting at national and international level. Before we start our wonderful program for the event today, I would like to take a few minutes to present an overview of ISO-IDF collaboration. IDF, ISO, and AOAC have started collaborating in 1963 upon request from the FAO WHO Committee on Code of Principle concerning milk and milk product, which was the predecessor of the Codex Committee on Milk and Milk Product, in order to limit duplication of methods applicable to dairy products. Between 1963 and 2001, almost each IDF standard published at an equivalent ISO standard and an AOAC standard. The content was technically the same, developed by John working groups, but written and presented differently. While the cooperation with AOAC ceased in early 2000, the IDF and ISO reinforced theirs by publishing one single standard with both IDF and ISO reference as of 2001, which means 20 years ago. This was a tremendous step forward, resulting in a much clearer choice and facility of use for the user and a better recognition for IDF and ISO. Today, I join standards for, methodology, for methods of analysis and sampling for milk and milk products are used worldwide by private and public laboratories for quality control, research, and compliant purposes to ensure their products traded worldwide are safe, nutritious, tasty, and authentic. To date, Codex has more than 30 standards of identity for dairy products, such as butter, fermented milk, or milk powder, in development, of which IDF regulatory experts have strongly been involved. All of them contain quality and safety provision, such as moisture content, microorganism content, or contaminant limits. Most of this provision can be verified by more than 60 IDF ISO standards or standards from other organizations. It means that these standards recommended by Codex are the go-to method to be used by manufacturer authorities, whether they are, as they are in international trade or not. They become a reference method that can be relied on to obtain results that should be trusted. 
The collaboration between IDF and ISO is key to this success and as is collaboration with other standard development organizations. Collaboration leads to harmonized or equivalent standards. Joint, stand, joint international standards are important to prevent duplication of work in the development of standards and to avoid confusion for the user. That is all what standardization is about reaching consensus between stakeholders in a broader sense and documenting it. I want to warmly thank all the experts involved without whom this, this publication, the publication of this standard will not be possible and welcome anyone that wished to contribute. We hope to resume our annual IDF ISO analytic, analytical week in April 2022, which is scheduled in Konstant, Germany, uh, in uh, mid, third week of April. And to renew, that would give us an opportunity to renew and network, which was disrupted during the pandemic. I look forward to hearing from our standard user later in the webinar and build upon their testimonies for further standardization work to be undertaken in our organization. I wish you a fruitful webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. Highlighting the, the really productive nature of this partnership between IDF and ISO. Next, we have uh, Sergio Mujico, who's the Secretary General of the International Standards Organization. Please. Dear friends and colleagues, members of the International Dairy Federation, for 20 years, our organizations have worked together in a unique partnership. Since 2001, we have shared a common objective to use IDF and ISO joint standards to ensure the quality and safety of dairy products around the world. Together, we have delivered. There are over 170 jointly developed IDF ISO standards that focus on techniques and sampling analysis and classification of dairy products. These standards are an essential component in maintaining food safety across the dairy sector, responsible for reducing diseases and saving many lives. This means that the million of people who enjoy milk, cheese and yogurt on a daily basis can be confident that their health is in good hands thanks to our unique collaboration. Our joint standards are also an essential ingredient in the global dairy trade, facilitating the movement of products around the world. At a time when global COVID pandemic continues to cast a shadow of doubt over people's life we are bringing welcome reassurance to consumers every day. This year, the IDF and ISO published six international standards together, including a standard to identify contamination in powder baby milk, a standard to determine whether plant toxins from animal feed are present in milk, and international guidelines to establish whether milk contains residues of antibiotics used to treat animals. But we are not stopping there. We will continue to build on our 20-year collaboration and on our strong engagement with international partners and stakeholders such as FAO and Codex. This year, during our annual joint IDF ISO virtual analytical meetings, we successfully identified 11 new standards and guidelines to be published in the next year, which will also support innovation in the dairy industry. Looking ahead, our work will touch on new areas, such as the possible use of image analysis to create a globally harmonized method for objective analysis of casing and casinets, and the potential of nuclear magnetic resonance to establish 
true fat value determination on a large range of dairy products without calibration. In both cases, these innovative techniques have the potential to not only reinforce public health and confidence, but to enable trade and help improve the profitability of the dairy industry. With the cost of global transport remaining higher than pre-COVID, producers need every possible assistance to improve margins, reducing the burden of testing and paperwork and setting the standards that ensure products will not be delayed or stopped at borders. This is even more important when it comes to temperature sensitive items that can spoil if not stored or transported correctly. Our organizations have worked very well together to produce a wide range of professional standards for the dairy industry. And that work and our collaboration will continue in the future. Today, I am delighted to join you by video to celebrate what we have achieved together. I look forward to building on our joint work in support the dairy industry, which needs international standards more than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergio, for that uh, recording, illustrating really well the importance of the work that we do. Our first, now we'll turn on to our expert speakers. I no, would note the session is being recorded and it'll be uh, available via both the IDF and ISO websites. Our first speaker is Wendy Warren from the US Department of Agriculture. Wendy is a microbiologist with over 20 years experience in food safety and quality. And she currently works in the Agricultural Marketing Service Dairy Program of the USDA. And she's the chair of the US Technical Advisory Group to the ISO Technical Committee 34, uh, Subcommittee 5 for Milk and Milk Products. Please, Wendy. Thank you, Steve. I am so pleased to be here with you today to have the opportunity to talk about the use and harmonization of international standards. So for our discussion today, obviously we are all going to be talking about the importance of internationally harmonized standards. We um, are also in the context of my discussion going to be discussing the use of IDF ISO standards from the government or control authority perspective. And this is as it relates to compliance with codex commodity standards. I'm going to go a little bit into the mechanics of that process because it is quite, um, quite complex. And I think it's very important to make sure that as the users of standards and those that participate in the development of these standards, we all kind of understand the mechanics and can get involved where it makes most sense. I will also be emphasizing the importance of participation and um, collaboration in this joint effort between IDF and ISO in standard developments. As we've already heard, there's been a lot of great work done, but there's a lot of work yet to be done. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So I would like to just start with the concept of a standard. It's a very broad term and we use it a lot. We use standards a lot. So I thought it would be worthwhile just touching base on this. I pulled a simple Google um, definition for standard the other day. It says an idea or a thing used as a measure, norm, or model in comparative evaluations. Okay, that generally fits. Um, we use standards for so many different purposes and based on the intended use, they contain different elements or components. And as we develop these standards, that truly um, it matters with regard to who's involved with standard development and making sure that those standards are suitable for purpose. We use standards as a tool to establish expectations and provide criteria to verify key quality and or safety aspects. This helps to, to be able to referee disputes. Um, if it's all spelled out in expectation, it allows us to make very clear decisions. Standards can also provide guidance on preparing an item and or performing a process that can have many variables. And we all know working in the laboratory arena and working with agricultural commodities, there can be many variables. Standards in this role can help to manage the variables that can be managed. 
Standards are typically developed and or reviewed through collaboration of subject matter experts and other key stakeholders. And as we've already talked about, the IDF ISO relationship has been quite fruitful. Um, and I would put in a, a comment about how this collaboration and how making sure we have the right folks involved in this process is super critical for continuing to enjoy this success. Next slide, please. So specifically related to the standards that we're talking about in the context of my discussion, uh, I would like to comment about Codex Commodity Standards. These serve as a global reference for governments and food processors that provide expectations for composition and quality factors. They also provide many other elements, but for our short discussion today, I'd like to just focus in on composition and quality factors. And those standards include the target analytes that you would look for with regard to, to composition and quality factors, as well as the acceptable levels. And the main purpose of these standards is to protect consumer health and ensure fair trade practices. With regard to IDF ISO standards, these are analytical methods, and these standards provide technical instructions for laboratories and or quality assurance departments on how to accurately and reliably examine dairy commodities for a target analyte. And of course, this type of standard is key in minimizing the normal variance that just occurs in laboratory analysis in general and certainly occurs um, with regard to analyzing very complex agricultural commodities. And again, you could see the skill sets of the individuals that are involved in the development of each of these types of standards is really important to, to produce a standard that works um, across the board and for its intended purpose. Next slide, please. So my perspective is coming from the government or control authority perspective. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what I do and the organization that I work with. Um, I work with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Agricultural Marketing Service Dairy Program. And our mission is to facilitate the efficient marketing of milk and dairy products. And in this role, you might imagine we rely on a lot of different types of standards to fulfill this mission. Um, sometimes it's used uh, to referee differences between parties, and sometimes it helps us make very important de decisions. Uh, some of the activities that we're involved in is we administer the federal milk marketing orders to facilitate the marketing of fresh milk in the United States. Uh, we provide a variety of services, including dairy commodity grading based on established grade standards. So those are used to help us make very important decisions about dairy commodities and whether they meet a certain grade standard or not. Uh, we also provide export certification to assist in the exportation of dairy products. And importantly, we cooperate with the Food and Drug Administration or FDA in our country, which is the U.S. agency that has regulatory authority over dairy products. Next slide, please. So in the, the recent um, past, we have become accredited uh, by the U.S. national member body to ISO, the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, as the um, administrator of the U.S. Technical Advisory Group, or TAG, for ISO Technical Committee 34, Subcommittee 5, which has responsibility over uh, standards that are designed for milk and milk products. Uh, this uh, tag really serves as our U.S. mirror committee to the ISO technical committee for these standards, and it is represented by all sectors of the U.S. dairy industry and includes U.S. IDF members. I can tell you uh, before the COVID pandemic, we did have the opportunity to squeeze in one in-person meeting and 
all the membership that was present in that room, um, the major and clear majority indicated that the primary reason why they were involved in the TAG was to ensure uh, the harmonization of international standards. It's very important for a variety of reasons. Next slide, please. So some of the key activities of the TAG is we determine the U.S. consensus position for IDF ISO standards, and these are at various stages of development. And I can tell you that uh, I have gained a tremendous amount of appreciation for the work and effort that goes into this process. Um, I, I was a user of standards from an industry standpoint for many years, had no idea how much work goes into developing these standards. And it is quite remarkable, the success um, that this collaboration has yielded. We also attended attend IDF ISO meetings for TC34 SC5. And we nominate subject matter experts from the TAG to serve on the technical working groups to develop these standards. And in the context of this partnership, they are IDF action teams. And these action teams work collaboratively to update and develop new IDF ISO standards. Next slide, please. We also participate in codex activities. We collaborate in this role with many federal agencies within the US. Um, and this activity is facilitated by the US Codex Office, which also happens to be housed at USDA. In this role, we engage stakeholders to support Codex in protecting the health of consumers and ensuring fair trade practices in food trade in general. We also serve on multiple committees within Codex, but for today's discussion, I want to focus on one committee in particular. Next slide, please. And that is the Codex Committee on Methods of Analysis and Sampling, or CCMAS. This is the Codex Committee that endorses methods of analysis for checking compliance with Codex commodity standards. And in doing so, uh, they recently have come up with what I think is a fantastic um, idea in terms of listing analytical standards in a single um, codex standard that's referred to as Codex 234. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit further about Standard 234. But this committee also, in addition to the General Codex Procedure Manual, has developed a comprehensive guidance for the process of submission, consideration, and endorsement of methods for inclusion in this Codex Standard 234. And this guidance is certainly very important in order to better, um, for better understanding of the expectations in the process of method endorsement. And so in talking about 234 a little bit further on the next slide, The purpose of the standard is meant to be a one-stop shop for analytical methods used in checking compliance with Codex Commodity Standards. And these methods are organized by commodity type and updates within the standard have been organized into what's referred to as work packages. And um, IDF and other standard development organizations, uh, along with ICO, I, ISO, have been instrumental in reviewing what is referred to as the dairy workable package. And we heard about this earlier in, in Caroline's comments about the major successes that have been had here. And um, I think we'll continue to see um, the future of, of innovation and standards as mentioned by Sergio in his video, continue to be updated in this codex standard. Um, I also believe that this will continue to be a go-to resource for analytical methods, which can be quite confusing at times in terms of trying to understand the best way to evaluate agricultural commodities. Next slide, please. So to cite a specific um, example of a, a Codex Commodity Standard and how it relates to the IDF ISO standard to verify compliance, I'm using the standard for butter. 
And I'm focusing in on one specific composition requirement. And in that standard, which is 279, there is a composition requirement for a minimum milk fat level of 80%. So when you go to uh, codex standard 234, and you look under milk fat determination, you will see that ISO standard 17678 joint IDF standard 194, which is entitled butter, edible oil emulsions and spreadable fat for the determination of fat content is listed under that category. Next slide, please. And so this method, um, as we've already talked about, would be the endorsed method to evaluate milk fat and butter if there were any international trade disputes. But I would also like to point out, and Caroline mentioned this as well, is this can also serve as a go-to reference method to validate any alternate fat methods that may be used by the industry at large for routine butter analysis. So, in this case, perhaps the ISO method, the ISO IDF method is not practical for everyday use. Um, maybe it uses equipment or standards or requires a higher level of technical expertise than, than the everyday processor is able to obtain. This method can be used to demonstrate that the alternate method is accurate and reliable. So an example that I've used is near-infrared based fat analysis. And you can see by the manufacturers of equipment that are used for this purpose, they refer to this standard in order to validate and perform, re, uh, perform routine calibrations of the instrument to ensure it's accurate and reliable and so that you don't get into a situation where your data could be questioned. Next slide, please. So this brings me to the very important topic of participation. As we've talked about already today, finding the common ground for international standard harmonization is challenging, but it's essential to producing safe and nutritious food while ensuring fair trade. This collaboration is key to developing standards that are useful for all parties using the standards. Development and suitability of international standards relies on the participation of subject matter experts and key stakeholders. So based on the elements and components that are on in, within a given standard and what its intended purpose is, relies so heavily on who is part of bringing knowledge to the table and optimizing the standard so that it is fit for purpose. Acceptance of harmonized international standards by multiple countries with varying regulatory requirements again demands co collaboration. Participation, though, in this process offers many benefits, and I would like to go through a few of those in the next slide. So why should one participate in this process? And maybe this is a reminder for some of us that are already involved in in this process. Um, you know, certainly you can represent the needs and ex expectations of your country, of your organization, while working for the greater good of harmonizing standards across the globe. Um, it's certainly an opportunity to network with subject matter experts from across the globe to gain technical knowledge and insights. It's an opportunity to develop or mentor someone with regard to technical writing skills, communication, teamwork, leadership, and time management skills. You also have the opportunity to have real-time awareness of any upcoming requirements with global trading partners, since you're right in the middle of these discussions and concerns that might be raised about upcoming issues. And again, the mentoring opportunity is, is quite substantial with regard to bringing colleagues or perhaps younger professionals into the 
process of international standard de development to ensure that continued and action support occurs as we continue to strengthen this partnership and bring new methods and innovation into um, this process. So I would like to thank you for your time and attention today and um, look forward to seeing many of you in participating in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. That's a, it's a great overview of the importance of uh, harmonization and how the US manages from their perspective, which is a large and complex sector and integration with the, the IDF and ISO process as well. Really appreciate that oversight. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, two speakers from HUWEC, the uh, uh, a global uh, leading supplier of uh, global dairy ingredients. <laughs> have uh, Anne-Marie Anne -Marie Jose Hendricks, who's a QA technology specialist. Uh, she's an interest and background in nutrition and food safety. And uh, she's worked in a range of different uh, functions, both in industry and government. We also have Anna-Marie Braber, who's a technical sales support specialist at HUWACT. And uh, she, she has a background in food technology, microbiology and quality management. And she's uh, worked in a range of different areas as well. So please, Marie Jose and Anne-Marie. Well, thanks a lot, Steve, uh, for the introduction and uh, congratulations on the anniversary. Um, it is a real honor to be invited as a speaker for this uh, webinar. And uh, Anna-Marie and I will share with you the importance of the availability of the international standards for us as uh, dairy traders. And uh, we will do this by sharing the main purposes uh, of use, uh, followed by some examples. And the next uh, sheet, please. But uh, first, an uh, introduction of uh, Hoogwecht. Hoogwecht is a trader in dairy products. Henk Hoogwecht uh, founded the dairy company, of an exporting company in the Netherlands in uh, 1965. And uh, the company grew and grew, and it became now the largest privately held supplier of dairy products um, in the world, with a yearly turnover of uh, 2.9 billion euro, representing approximately 2 million metric tons of uh, product per year. We are active in over 130 countries worldwide, and. Um, we are also working with 450 employees, which are located uh, at different um, uh, uh, locations. For example, in, uh, in Asia, China and Singapore, in the EU, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, in which also the headquarter is uh, present in Poland, but also in the US and in Argentina. And uh, on the next sheet, our, our uh, product portfolio is uh, present. We are uh, trading in a great diversity of products and uh, also in diverse range of uh, applications. Our uh, business unit uh, essential milk products is uh, trading in um, milk powders, for example, uh, skim milk powder or whole milk powder, whey powders and uh, butter. The business unit dairy ingredients uh, specializes in customized ingredients for the food industry. And on top of that also provides uh, high protein dairy ingredients like um, milk and whey protein concentrates. Hoogrecht cheese, yeah, the name mentioned it already, but is uh, responsible for um, the trade of cheese products, for example, cheddar, mozzarella, and uh, Mazdam. And the business uni unit uh, liquid dairy provides the European market with an uh, extensive range of liquid dairy products and, uh, and concentrates. These uh, dairy products have very diverse uh, applications and outlets, and we also have customers uh, in all different regions uh, of the world. 
And of course, we want to make sure that the products we deliver are uh, safe. So in order to assure these um, requirements and be in compliance, we uh, use uh, systems like IFS Broker and ISO 2018 um, uh, to assure the system. And, uh, but we also have uh, uh, more specialized certificates like organic and vlog. Then on the uh, next sheet, uh, we have tried to capture our use of uh, ISO and IDF standards in uh, three main topics, uh, namely the Codex Alimentarius, uh, specifications and gathering uh, data. And it was quite a challenge uh, to summarize this tool, um, which we use a lot on, on a daily basis and for all types of uh, activities, and most of the time even uh, subconscious. So um, it was quite a challenge to, um, well, to summarize this on one sheet. But starting with the first topic, the Codex Alimentarius, um, well, I use it within my function, function really on a daily basis, just to refer to the standards, uh, to the limits used, um, and also to the, um, uh, to the methods of analysis. And for example, in, in case uh, we need a specification for, from a surgeon Rijo, um, uh, and we need a specification, which is also widely accepted by our customers uh, worldwide. We refer to, uh, to the Codex Alimentarius as um, a standard. So the products traded must comply with relevant Codex standards. What you got? That's fine. In the, I, I continue, okay? Yeah, please continue. Thank you. If we look at uh, specifications, we are dealing with uh, um, mainly supplier specifications and customer specifications, besides our own uh, specifications. And uh, if you look at uh, the supplier specifications, approximately 70% includes a reference uh, to a method of analysis in the specification. And in 50% um, of those cases, it's a reference to an ISO or IDF method. We use, we use these methods uh, as background information. If you, uh, if you look at the customer specifications, Approximately 70% of these specifications include a uh, reference method of analysis. And here in 90% of the cases is referred to an ISO IDF method. And other references are made, for example, to a GP standards, uh, um, more local standards like DIN, uh, BAM or ACPI, and, and the NIR uh, method. Um, and besides that, it also makes it possible for us to uh, do well. Besides uh, all effort, it might be that a customer is, um, the product delivered is not in line with the expectations. And the first step we take is to compare results and specifications from the supplier and the customer. And we know that the method of analysis may, different methods may result in uh, different results. And it might be a cause of complaints if the supplier uses a different method as, uh, as the customer. And in these type of uh, cases, and if the uh, situation allows it, 
we always try to achieve an uh, agreement on, uh, on a used method and Hoogrecht will uh, prevail international accepted methods like uh, ISO or, or IDF. And uh, gathering uh, uh, data, we perform quite a lot of uh, analysis or we do, do not uh, do it ourselves, but we have uh, analysis done by laboratory. And uh, one of the reasons is to investigate uh, complaints and to have a high acceptance of the results obtained, we use international uh, accepted stand standards for these analysis, like the uh, ISO IDF standards, just to have the supplier and the customer both um, uh, agree on the result. Uh, besides that, uh, we do also quite a lot of, uh, let's say, proactive uh, analysis in, um, in order, for example, to investigate if um, a product from a specific uh, supplier has characteristics. Um, so we can advise customers on, on these specific uh, products. And here also uh, for this type of analysis, we use international uh, recognized standards. So for also, uh, well, first of all, the results are reliable, but they will also be reproducible in uh, uh, other regions uh, in the world. Next uh, sheet, please. So I will continue with the uh, presentation. Um, uh, I will uh, present you some cases in which we are working uh, on, of which we are facing that we have some um, issues with a, a customer or a, or a supplier uh, where, where uh, the ISO or IDF uh, standards were involved. Uh, the first case is a, a case where we are working on now. It's about total play count. Um, um, uh, we have a, a purchase a, a skin milk powder from a European uh, supplier, uh, and that, that, that skin milk powder is released based on the ISO uh, norm of, of 4833. And this product is uh, exported to Asia. And our customer in Asia is uh, using this skin milk powder in their final products. And this final product is being exported to Japan. And the Japanese, uh, I, I think the Japanese uh, authority, but also the Japanese customer, requires the uh, the the product, the final product, to be released uh, on a Japanese uh, standard um, from the GTDA. And uh, what we see, our customer in Asia sees that um, when uh, the, 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 the they analyze the skin milk powder uh, on total plate count. They see a difference between the ISO standards and the Japanese standards. And in the table below, you see uh, very quite drastic uh, uh, changes of uh, differences. It's uh, sometimes it's, it's more like a factor of 100. And I have to say, this is uh, this it looks like this is a consistent situation, but that's not the case. It's just an example. We also see batches which that are compliant. And that you see more, that's the same results with both methods. Uh, and so it's not always the same situation, but our, this is a big problem for our customer, of course, because they buy skin milk powder with a very low, according to the ISO method, a very low uh, 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 total play count. And when releasing the, the, the material for their final products, they see that with the Japanese standard, they find a very high um, uh, total play count uh, concentration. And uh, at, uh, uh, until now, we are not able to uh, reproduce the results in the EU with the, the samples of our supplier. So we're really thinking what, 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 what is the cause for this, uh, this, this difference? 
Uh, suppliers suggest that it might be uh, due to metabolic spores, but uh, that's all very, su uh, very uh, suggestive. We really, see, really, we really don't know. So this is one of the uh, topics that we are uh, facing when uh, working with standards in international trade. Uh, next slide, please. So the second case is about protein uh, uh, analysis. Um, what we saw is that uh, um, we, we had quite some batches of skin milk powder which were re rejected when we exported them to China uh, and also to Korea. And um, despite the, that the, the protein level in the skin milk powder was according to, um, to the codex uh, uh, requirements of uh, 33% uh, of protein. Um, so this 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 uh, happens a lot uh, happens quite often with different suppliers. Um, so then we decided to do a small survey with 31 samples, which were analyzed with a reference method in the ISO uh, um, 9886 and the Duma, that's the Kjeldon Duma. And uh, different laboratory, uh, laboratories, uh, um, accredited laboratories for these methods, um, which were in the EU, in China, and in Korea, and also at some of our customers in China. Um, and we compared the results uh, which we obtained with these methods and these laboratories. And um, uh, in the next slide, there's a, an overview, a, a more, a more uh, indicative. Uh, um, picture of the results that we are obtained. So here you see all the different uh, laboratories that we used and uh, uh, um, the, the results they obtained. And this is just uh, a very rough indication that, that we, we have to show the effort, the difference from the efforts, the efforts obtained by these, these laboratories. And well, what we saw is that in, in general, really, really in general, that the demand methods uh, uh, the demand method we obtained a little bit lower uh, level in protein, but that was very uh, diff uh, very uh, dependent on the laboratory that we uh, we used. But in also we saw that with the Kjeldal uh, method, um, from, uh, according to ISO, we uh, found a little bit higher uh, protein level compared to the DB uh, standards, and that uh, led to the uh, decision that we uh, for some customers in China, we select batches with a, a slightly higher um, uh, protein level just to avoid that these batches are being rejected at custom in, in customs in China or re rejected by the, uh, by the um, customer. Next slide, please. Another um, um, uh, question which, which, which was asked to us is where, where we see, see other challenges or uh, questions that might uh, uh, can be improved. And uh, I wanted to discuss the methods on, on scarce particles analysis. That is the one that we are using uh, um, a lot. And we have many, many questions about it. Um, in general, all uh, uh, suppliers use the uh, at the, at the method uh, 916, um, and, and where you uh, have make a solution of the powder and you uh, put it over a filter, and then you uh, you compare it with the with the standard class A, B, C, and D, which are also presented on the slides. And uh, based on that, you determine whether the powder uh, complies with the um, with, with a critical a criteria for um, scorched particles. Um, the disadvantage of the method is that it only determines non-soluble particles. It's semi-qualitative because you always have to uh, uh, have to compare it to these these uh, these um, these pictures. And it's not, as we have seen, that it's not, not every person uh, judges the, the, the pictures in the, uh, in the same class. And also the methods are really influenced by the temperature used, the amount of shear, it, which is being uh, done uh, on the sample, the time used. So it's, it's um, 
quite a, uh, we had quite some disputes on um, results with this method. And another disadvantage is that, uh, well, suppliers use this method only on their specifications. Uh, and they um, rely on that, and also in case of the dispute, they will say, "Okay, this is this is what uh, yeah, this is um, what I guarantee." But uh, and also customers uh, most of the time have only this method on their specification. But especially if they have uh, dry blending applications and they use the powder in their uh, dry blended products, and in that case, the soluble particles. The soluble particles are uh, the, of the non soluble. The soluble particles, yes, are, are also very re relevant because you can see them in the powder. And for these these um, these situations, there is not that there is a lack of a standardized methods, and that is quite a uh, quite often a reason for the dispute between parties. And we are in the middle of that, and and then we try to uh, well to be. Uh, uh, cooperative as much as we can, but sometimes it leads to, to uh, complicated situations. Next slide, please. So the topics of interest for us in where we, we see some uh, opportunities for ISO IDF to, uh, to work on further harmonization uh, of methods is uh, on these three topics. The first is force. Um, well, for, for instance, the high, uh, the heat, heat stable products we, which we sell, those are um, uh, also a lot of the time they have uh, um, requirements for spores. And um, there are a lot of different methods in, uh, in the industry used. Um, they use different media to, uh, to um, had to grow the bacteria on and also different heat treatments to uh, uh, to uh, inactivate the vegetative cells. Uh, of course, spores, uh, mesophilic, for us, the mesophilic aerobic and the uh, thermophilic aerobic spores, which are the main, uh, main topic. Um, this, this, these groups are very diverse, so it's quite different, difficult to, uh, to have one method which cover them, covers them all. But we see uh, lots of differences in regions um, um, and also uh, products, and that that makes the comparison comparison between um, method of, uh, specifications from suppliers and customers uh, sometimes quite quite challenging. Challenging. So it would be very very nice if we have a more harmonized uh, method uh, for these these uh, these groups. Another uh, example is about heat stability. It's also a little bit related, no, a little bit related to the to the spores. Uh, so high stable products are are really special uh, specialty product for us. So the customer is uh, willing to pay uh, pay more for these type of products. And there's a really the, in, in this case the variety of of methods are, is even more uh, um, is even bigger. We see methods uh, in industry used uh, based on viscosity, on heat coagulation, and on sediments. And also, um, customers uh, often use their um, use their application tests, so they can prepare a small amount of product and use their own process conditions to see whether uh, a batch is heat stable or not. Uh, so it's also very very hard to compare. Um, uh, specifications and to, co to compare customer requirements uh, with uh, with with uh, things that uh, our, our suppliers can uh, can can supply. And yeah, and Mario, do you say want to uh, tell you something about allergens? And uh, yeah, undeclared uh, allergens present in food products is a really a major uh, food safety issue. And uh, in relation to this, for example, EU uh, legislation uh, became stricter on this topic uh, this year, uh, especially on cross-contamination. And I found it quite remarkable that uh, within the supply chain, the major assurance of, um, of allergens is based on a system to prevent cross-contamination and to assure uh, correct labeling of products and uh, we see it in all uh, different uh, 
uh, issues, for example, we can never share it by either the supplier or the customer a um, uh, method to analyze uh, allergens. However, in the majority of the specifications, uh, absence is a requirement. Um, we are we do not have issues on this topic at the moment, like with the spores or the heat stabilities. Uh, however, I find it uh, quite remarkable that there is no uh, international use standard for uh, uh, the analysis of allergens. And on the next sheet, Well, <clears throat> I hope we made it clear that uh, standards are very useful to us as reference methods in fair, a great variety of situations. And, uh, and then we are really dealing with issues if we do not have these uh, standards. So yeah, in other words, uh, the presence of uniform worldwide accepted uh, standards make our lives a lot easier. So thanks a lot on all the great work you do there. And, um, and there are also, uh, uh, yeah, well, still, there, there are opportunities uh, available for further harmonization. Thank you very much, Marie Hosea and Marie. That's a really good uh, overview once again of how for a company like yours the importance of standards facilitate global trade and we're all aware of some of the examples you gave resonate very very strongly with us we're all aware of issues where uh, one organization's done some testing another a different organization tests nominally the same samples and we see differences and we need to resolve them and the harmonization of methods goes a long way towards assisting that and reducing any friction due to due to these differences so th thank you very much again our next speaker, speaker is Barbara Gerton. Barbara's got a, a, a long experience with the, uh, quality control and research and development in the dairy industry. Uh, she currently, since 2008, works for uh, Merck in Germany, in which she works in regulatory marketing. She's also one of my colleagues within the IDF ISO, and she's the chair of the IDF Standing Committee of uh, harmonization of microbiological methods. And she plays a really important role as well in liaison, liaison with uh, ISO and SEN methods, uh, which, which is heavily involved and ensures that we actually, uh, around the area of microbiology, uh, we're all speaking the same language and, and talking in the, in the same direction. So please, Barbara. Yeah, welcome and <clears throat> thanks for the invitation first. And it's also a great honor for me to speak here uh, on this 20th year anniversary <clears throat> of ISO IDF harmonized standards. Uh, so next slide, please. <clears throat> So my topic will be mostly on the harmonization of microbiological uh, methods and standards. <clears throat> I'm using personally ISO IDF standards daily, really my whole work life since more than 20 years, I have to say. Uh, mostly in work uh, as a global company for internal and external support, really worldwide internal uh, in market for being compliant with our products, but of course a lot of external support for trainings on applications worldwide, <clears throat> technical support to labs, user labs, and uh, <clears throat> really also to support uh, national and international standardization experts to participate, active uh, participate in the standardization process mostly in my case for microbiological uh, methods. So uh, this harmonization is a key focus in the food microbiology since long time, I have to say. <clears throat> and um, uh, we have a very close liaison between the ISO TC34 SC5, milk and milk products and IDF, of course. But we have also a very close and good collaboration liaison with the ISO TC34 SC9 food products, microbiology, and the SEN Technical Committee TC463 microbiology of the food chain. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. I would like to bring you uh, two examples. The first example is a really pure ISO IDF standard, the ISO IDF standard for milk products, enumeration of presumptive bifida bacteria, the colony count technique at 37 degrees. It is a so-called vertical standard, means it is really for the uh, vertical analysis of milk products. It was prepared and uh, by ISO TC34 SC5 in liaison with IDF and published in 2010 in the first edition jointly by ISO and IDF. This standard is currently under revision and uh, this work is carried out, including a validation in a joint ISO IDF action team, AT, by the project lead of Japan, um, Japanese expert. Under the Standing Committee on Analytical Methods for Dairy Microorganisms, the SCAMDM. It's very important that uh, it, uh, uh, it is revised and <clears throat> will include also the validation of the revised methodology. Because only if it is validated, it can be verified when an accredited lab wants to use it. Because for the verification, you will need the validation data with, in this case, the milk products. Next slide, please. Another very important example is the international standard ISO 6579 part one on the <coughs> microbiology of the food chain. Here we have really a horizontal standard covering the whole food chain here it is a horizontal method for the detection, enumeration, serotyping of salmonella. The so part one here, the detection of salmonella species. This horizontal standard was prepared by ISO TC34 SC9 and the European Standardization CEN as a full horizontal standard, CEN, EN and ISO standard. In former times, there was also a vertical standard on the detection of Salmonella species, the ISO 6785 IDF 93, published by 2001, which covered only the milk and milk products. So here we had the situation that we had a standard, <coughs> a horizontal standard for Salmonella detection and one standard only for milk and milk products. During the last revision, <coughs> it was then uh, decided to uh, replace the vertical standard for milk and milk products and to include it really in the horizontal standard to make the horizontal standard applicable to all samples from the food chain. For this, it was also necessary to include a, spe a specific prolonged incubation and se second subculturing for dried milk products and cheese. And the method validation study of the ISO 6579 part one, the first edition from 2017, also included milk and dairy products. Next slide, please. Next, yes, thank you. In this case, the harmonization work was carried out in close cooperation with the Standing Committee on Harmonization of Microbiological Methods, the SCHMM. The EN ISO standard for detection of Salmonella uh, 6579 part one is stated in the European Commission Regulation on Microbiological Criteria for Foodstuffs. 2007-3 from 2005 and its amendments. As an analytical reference method for Salmonella for all food categories were applicable, of course, including the dairy products. So it's very good that we have now really a full Harmona standard on the detection of Salmonella species. 
This was only possible, next slide please. Because we had a lot of <clears throat> demand for this standardization. And I, will, I would like to show you in a very few words, a simplified diagram, how the main steps are for the development and publication of a standard. In our case, an ISO IDF standard, for example, or also only an ISO standard. First, we need a demand of standardization or revision of a method from the industry from consumer health or regulation or others. And thanks, my personal thanks uh, to Anne-Marie and Marie-José to mention uh, the standardization on sports. Here um, I can give you the information that we have an actual work uh, in uh, on the um, <clears throat> sports standardization of accounting of sports and we have an active working group in the uh, horizontal standing committee of uh, food microbiology. We are here in the first step in the preliminary work. So we have a working group expert and a convener which prepares a working draft with participating member countries from all over the world, including liaison members from IDF, which can send experts. So currently we collected for the sports uh, all the methods available and uh, put uh, the information together as really as a starting point. From this, like uh, the, for the development for all other standards on analytical methods, a committee draft is prepared followed by a draft international standards. Both are shared, uh, of course, with the public uh, and with the experts. Technical comments are possible and always discussed back then in the expert working group. After this, the final uh, draft standard is prepared and followed by the publication as a joint ISO-IDF standard like the example for the colony count technique uh, for bifidobacteria. It is then has an ISO number and an IDF number, both printed really on the right corner of the standard. And, um, but if it is a uh, standard, an ISO standard, which is uh, a horizontal standard, not covering only the mix sector, like the salmonella standard, this will have only an ISO standard and will lose its IDF number when it's becoming from the mix sector to a horizontal to a global standard. So it's very, very important that especially in the working group, experts really from all over the world, from the different interested groups, are really participating and uh, to the active work uh, in this standardization. Next slide, please. These working groups meetings are attended by the experts, appointing, appointed by the P members, participating member countries and liaison organizations like IDF, for example. ISO TC34 SC5 IDF can appoint experts to the working groups of food microbiology to represent their individual know-how on a given subject, for example, from perspectives of the dairy sector. Next slide, please. The experts in the working group these are that develop the ISO standards work in the field. They understand and anticipate the challenges of their sector. Thanks also to Wendy to mention this and to describe this, using standardization as a tool to create a level playing field that benefits for everyone. So participation is really the key word in harmonized standards, which includes the analysis of diary samples wherever possible. With this, I would like to thank you and open for every question. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. That's a, it's a really good illustration of the 
uh, the process that uh, we go through when we're developing standards and also with specific examples, uh, once again, the importance of harmonization. I'd like to thank all the, uh, all the speakers that we've had. I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for their really useful insights and different perspectives on how harmonized uh, standards uh, facilitate trade and help uh, within our industry. And I'll now, we've had a number of questions come through. I'll ask the uh, speakers just to turn their cameras on and we've got some specific uh, questions uh, that we'll go through if that's okay. Uh, first up, we have uh, one for Wendy. Uh, Wendy, you, you, lost, you, you mentioned really well the, uh, the benefits of participation in the process. And we really appreciate that because it's something those of us involved uh, are really focused on, ensuring that we have good and comprehensive participation. Um, what's, the, what's the best way we can encourage further participation in your perspective of uh, experts in the standards development process? That's a great question. So I think one, you know, Barbara, way to kind of pinpoint the daily work piece, because those are the types of experts that we need. The folks that are using the standards every day that know the insights, that know the technical part, that know the practical part. Um, that's a tricky person to find, right? Because everybody has a full-time job. <laughs> and so usually there's not extra time carved out for this type of activity. And I think um, what we need to try and do is turn this into a value for organizations that um, employ individuals that have this type of knowledge and make sure they know the benefit to their organization. So can we turn some of these troubles into a dollar amount or saved time or what have you. And then we can justify um, carving out time in a person's daily schedule rather than requiring them to do this after hours or on weekends. Because I, I do know that a lot of our volunteers put in extra, a lot of extra time um, to be able to do this. But if it could be part of their job and the important part of their job, then I think that could help. Oh, that's great, Wendy. I really appreciate it and certainly align with those views. Thank you very much. I've got a question to Marie Jose and, and Marie. Um, no question. Uh, hang on, we'll just we'll do the questions that have come through in chat, please, if that's okay. Uh, how is knowledge information on the standards organized and structured in the company, e.g. at an expert level, individually, or at a business group level, or is it centralized, or are there other, are there other ways about the knowledge and information on standards uh, within Hukwank? Yeah, uh, we are a, a quite a big company with locations everywhere. Um, and we have a, a QA experts, which are responsible to make the translation from uh, generic standards to, uh, let's say, procedures, which are specifically for Hoogweg. Um, uh, well, uh, as speaking, uh, right now, we are really ma making a transformation to a more centralized uh, expert team on, um, uh, yeah, for example, Codex Alimentarius uh, standards. So, uh, yeah. That's fine, Marie Jose, thank you. Yeah, there, I think it, it's always a challenge in any organization, ensuring that you have a, a, a consolidated response. I know at Fonterra, where I work, we have a group of maybe 15 or 20 people involved in the different areas. And it's really important that you have some element of centralization, but also appreciate that people will have their own perspectives as well. So you do need coordination. And as Wendy's mentioned as well, we need agreement at a senior level in the business. that This is fundamentally important. So you need that as well as you need the, some degree of visibility as well to maintain, to, as a really a license to operate, a permission to keep in, involvement in the process. And each organization is different. Okay. Got, got another question uh, from, uh, for, for Amory and uh, uh, Marie Jose. Referring to the methods and specifications, e.g. for milk powder, in which conditions reference is made to the NIRS, near infrared spectroscopy, uh, IDF standard on specifications, instead or next to reference methods for fat, protein, and moisture? So we're talking here about indirect methods versus direct methods. You're on mute, uh, Amory. Okay. No, it works, I think. Oh, good. Oh, no, sorry, you're back on mute. Yeah, no. 
Okay. Um, well, we see that the NRI methods are, are um, more often uh, on the specifications of the of, the, of our suppliers. Uh, there, uh, not with a not not uh, not with a reference to the IEF uh, number, I would say. Uh, and we, of course, you see in the daily daily work on the in the laboratories of the of the suppliers that they they using the NR NRR or on a daily basis. But we are using the reference methods may, may still mainly when uh, in cases of dispute. Yeah. Does it answer the question? Yep, that's fine, uh, Emery. Thank you very much. Uh, we've also got a hand up, Ayaz Ahmed. Would you like you have a question, please? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 how are you, everybody? Uh, uh, I, I, I'm from Pakistan. Uh, I, I'm uh, from PSQ, the Pakistan Standards and Quality Control Authority. There's the single national standards body in Pakistan. Uh, we make uh, standards for Pakistan. Uh, of course, we are the uh, members uh, uh, in this uh, IDF uh, uh, committee, ISO uh, for SC5 and other TCs as well. We have P membership and uh, uh, the O membership as well. Uh, my uh, in Pak I just want want to share something uh, regarding. Uh, uh, current scenario in Pakistan uh, on harmonization of the standards, especially the food standards. The standards. So, uh, in this, uh, 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 we are harmonizing because we have uh, uh, five, five, six provinces. We are we are harmonizing the standards. Uh, actually, uh, the standards are uh, harmonized, but uh, how to harmonize the imp implementation? I just wanted the, the, this is the big challenge for us. So um, this is my, my question regarding that because uh, the standards, the, those are being harmonized at NSB national standards body level. We sit together, the different uh, provinces sit together uh, at a federal platform, uh, then harmonize the standards. But uh, again, uh, there is the problem for implementation. So I just uh, uh, need guidance regarding that. Uh, the, there is the big challenge. Uh, I need solution. Uh, we, are, we are doing uh, very best, but uh, even then uh, I need the help regarding that. Please. Thanks, yeah. Ayaz. I appreciate that. Uh, Implementation is always a challenge. Wendy, would you like to give a perspective on that? Yeah, so with regard to implementation, there has to be some incentive around it. And sometimes it's forced incentive, and sometimes it is a benefit to a given industry. Um, so for the implementation, you really need to understand why the user is using it in the first place and why they're being asked to use it. And then it becomes a matter of campaigning to the folks that that can provide the incentive um, to want to use that. And sometimes you have to convince through lots of data, lots of information that shows that why wouldn't they want to use it? So um, it's a little bit of politics and information and data strategy that goes along with that. Thanks, Wendy. That, that's a, it's a good perspective, and it's really important to encourage. You can you can push things so much, but there needs to be some pull as well. And we appreciate every situation. But that's a great question. Thanks, uh, Barbara. We've got a question for for you as well uh, around this. And one of the the challenges with microbiological methods is they're often um, they're off more, quite often deployed more horizontally than the analytical chemistry methods because microbiology touches all foods. Analytical chemistry does too, but it can be more specific. So is there, there, there's obviously been a really a, a fundamental change in the microbiological area, microbiological testing area around use of molecular methods. Uh, this is both a challenge and an opportunity, but what, especially what do you see as the opportunity here for greater harmonization into the future? I know it's a complex question. Yeah, but uh, thanks for this important question. Uh, and of course, we can say that standardization is not closing the eyes. They are open to the modern times. Molecular methods are part of standardization where possible. And uh, in general, we can say, especially uh, for um, 
um, if we have a complicated um, or not so easy cultural method, uh, then um, molecular method is now really in the standardization and we have also general standards on the quality assurance of the thermal cyclers and the general usage of the molecular methods, we can say. And um, of course, we have also in microbiology a model how alternative methods can be um, really compared in validation and can be considered to be equivalent to a reference method by an uh, independent certification body. This is very special uh, in food microbiology um, and works very, very well for the acceptance, we have to say. So ISO is really open, but of course um, in the microbiology as, as in other, other methods, we have to see that the method can be used worldwide. So it's always okay. for us. Thanks, Barbara. That, that's, a, that's a great direction to head and a good, good example. Got a question around, can we expect that one day we could have harmonization of the GB methods from China um, methods and with ISO methods in order to have truly international methods? And the answer to that is, it's, it's something we can look forward to, but standardization and harmonization does take time. A lot of, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of different stakeholders in these areas, and to align and get consensus just takes time. So yes, it's something I think we could look forward to, and we're, it's an area we're actively working on, but we're not going to have it done next week or next even next year, unfortunately. It's something we continue, but continue to focus on really strongly, because uh, as we've seen, there's a lot of benefit to international trade and to various businesses involved in the dairy and the wider food industry around method harmonization. Uh, we've got a, a, a question for uh, uh, Nazif Tavari, please, if you'd like to unmute and ask. Okay, that's fine. If, if not, we've got another question uh, in finding, oh, hang on, just a question from Mary. In fact, more a comment on implementation uh, from Harry van Bijgaard in the Netherlands. In finding help with implementation, it's important to join a network of experts in developing standards that provides you with direct access to the subject matter. And this is another hidden benefit, I guess, or maybe not so hidden, of involvement in standards development organisations. And it's true for many of our businesses. We work to develop standards, but in doing so, we actually develop our network of international experts, or the people we're working with. And there may be from businesses that are actually competitors or customers as well. But the fact is we are engaged professionally and it gives us this uh, a ready-made network of experts we can leverage for a wide range of purposes as well. And I know personally I've benefited from that greatly in my involvement in the standards development process within IDF and ISO. I just got another question here. Is there a universal method for pasteurization or may, or may methods be on the way? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Uh, do we, <laughs> can I uh, throw that? Perhaps, Barbara, would you like to comment? Uh, uh, I can comment as well, perhaps. But, or, or uh, may, may I say something? May, may I say uh, something on this? Sure, pl please, yes. Uh, actually, uh, the uh, pasteurization uh, is also uh, becoming a problem uh, between uh, different regulations. So we have to harmonize it. We have to make it single one. So... Uh, how to make uh, that guideline uh, because uh, uh, I have seen different methods in that uh, like US FDA they are uh, doing that we, we have uh, uh, one, uh, one method there and other methods are uh, uh, international methods we are we are following but uh, even then there's a need for harmonizing that so uh, that's why I uh, raised the question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's certainly a challenging question. I don't know, Barbara, do you wish to comment briefly? Or? I can um, only say that um, it's not a typical uh, analytical method in microbiology. Of course, pasteurization for preparation of uh, culture media, we have a standard, it's part of a culture media standard, but pasteurization of, of uh, food samples, um, it's, uh, I cannot give any input by the moment. I'm sorry, sorry. A fair, fair point. It's something that's it's quite a, it's a really an, an engineering response. And we realize the conditions for pasteurization. It's also often tied up if, if dairy products are being traded between countries, there's regulations 
and standards around the process of pasteurization. Uh, but it's not typically in a, in a, uh, something we discuss specifically in, within this group. I think uh, unless there's any further questions, I'd like to um, or, uh, move towards wrapping up there. I'd like to first obviously thank all our speakers. Uh, I already just pointed out we have a standard for determination of alkaline phosphatase in various products that verify the process of pasteurization that's in the chat. So I'd like to thank our speakers today. We've heard once again people from different industries and different countries giving a really valued perspective that marks this, the 20th anniversary of the joint publication of IDF ISO uh, standards and that harmonization process. Realize it's a journey that we're on, but we also appreciate the importance to the global dairy, dairy industry of this work. I'd also like to thank all the participants we've had from uh, around the world. I'll remind you that the session has been recorded and we can, um, we can access that on the IDF and ISO websites. I'd also like to uh, mention, if you're interested in being involved in the standards development process, uh, you can invite interested experts, we can invite interested experts to contact their IDF National Committee or ISO member to join. Uh, we can put the links in the chat. And we'll also mention, as Carolyn mentioned, our next uh, meeting at IDF ISO is IDF ISO Analytical Week in uh, Konstant in, in, in Germany in April next year. Really hoping we're all meeting face to face, but there'll be, some, there'll be an opportunity for virtual attendance as well. This is where we get together and actually is a really important meeting to drive this harmonization process in the joint development of standards. So again, I'd just like to thank once again all, all the speakers and I hope you really enjoyed this, this today's webinar. Thank you very much.